we are uh, very much privileged to have uh, Rajpal Ragala uh, from Whitehead Institute join us this morning. Uh, he will uh, present to us a talk uh, titled Nanoscale Insights into the Mechanisms of Cellular Growth and Proliferation. And indeed, uh, will tell us about instrumentation in MIT Nano that is relatively recent and provides incredible views into the nanoscale of biological structures. Uh, Katsper, please take over. Thank you, Vladimir, for the invitation and for the kind introduction. Um, I'm really excited to, to share the research with, with everyone. I hope you can hear me, actually, um, that I've been doing for the last three and a half years in the, in the Sabatini lab at the Whitehead. And let me share my screen with you so you can um, see some of the slides that I prepared for you today. All right, here we go. Does that work? Um, Vladimir, can you can yes. tell me? Yes, yes, it's good. Okay, okay, perfect. Thanks. All right, so so you know, before before I actually started my postdoc, I uh, and the, the reason why I actually came to to study this biology and why I got in, in, uh, excited about the biology of of, of the Sabatini lab, I saw David present this um, this video once uh, in a conference and. And, and I wanted to show this to you, so you, you can also get excited about the things that I'm excited about. And, and it's a video that shows um, basically two eukaryotic cells. These are actually two human cells. And, um, and you can see the one here on the left and on the right, there's, there's two of them. And they have those massive nuclei. And what's special about those cells is that they have been starved for nutrients for something like one or two hours. And then at the time point zero, and you can see that timer here on the left, top left corner, and they've been re-stimulated with extra nutrients. Okay, and let me play that video so you'll see what happened after, after they've been really injected with extra, extra food. And you'll immediately see that within something like 12 minutes, there's all those extra punctate that just, they just appeared. So let me, let me pause this and rewind. So you'll see that, let's go to type point zero. And now I'm gonna fast forward. Um, and you'll see that punctate start appearing around minute 15, 12 to 15. So it really fascinated me that, you know, something like this can happen this fast on a, it is quite fast on a, like with a, with a living cell. It's, it's a proper machine, right? Like how does this happen? And, and, and those punctate that you can see actually here uh, are fluorescent dots of, of a protein called green fluorescent protein that was fused to another protein called mTOR. And mTOR pretty much is the epicenter of what we study in the lab. And, um, and it fascinated me that this protein mTOR clearly can detect those amino acids in the cell and then change its localization to those distinct punctate. And our lab discovered that those punctate are not just some kind of aggregation, but these are actual organelles in the cell. And those organelles are called lysosomes. And as, you, as many of you know, lysosomes are those recycling machineries of the cell. They take material, they process it, and they release small building blocks for the cell to grow, okay? So it fascinated me, like how, how can this mTOR really recognize that it has to land on this lysosome at a particular time only when nutrients are available? Is, and I, I, would, I would start to imagine that, you know, there has to be some kind of anchor that docks on the surface of that lysosome, and there must be some kind of physical interaction between those two things and, and some kind of specificity, right? Why does this landing not happen when the nutrients are absent? It only happens when they're present. So I thought, as a structural biologist, I thought I could answer this kind of question because I could look at those proteins directly and maybe infer how those things actually work. All right, and, and here's, the, here's mTOR. And mTOR was discovered in, um, uh, by David when he was a graduate student. And then over, over, over many years, him and other labs actually mapped the entire pathway, what proteins are involved. And, and mTOR doesn't come alone. It actually uh, forms a complex um, with, with another two proteins called MLST8 and Raptor. And on the other side is, is the lysosome, and lysosome has another two proteins, or a, a complex of actually seven proteins. Um, there's those two proteins called RAGs, RAG GDPases, and these are small G proteins uh, that can bind to nucleotides, as, as I've drawn here. And they're bound to another protein called regulator. 
And the regulator is really special because it has this very, very long tail at the end of which there's a, there's a lipid modification such that this it can stick inside of the lysosomal membrane that you can see, which maintains that low pH um, inside of it such that it can degrade all those, all those proteins, okay? And, and what's special about those racks is they can really act as switches. So they can take in a nucleotide, a small molecule called guanidine triphosphate and hydrolyze it into a diphosphate. They chop off one group at the end of that molecule and, and, and can switch the conformation, okay? And as you can see, there's two of them. And, and when they switch to the opposite state, where RAG A has a triphosphate bound and RAG C has a diphosphate bound, all of a sudden Raptor, somehow, we don't know how, can recognize that signal, bind to them, and the food dock the entire mTOR to the, the surface of the lysosome, okay? And this is actually not the end of the story because even though mTOR is docked on the lysosome, it still is inactive, okay? And that activity is only conferred when as a third GTPase protein present is called REB. And REB also has that lipid tail and it sits on the surface of the lysosome and it can bind to a nucleotide. And in the case where it's a triphosphate bound, it can stick to mTOR and activate the function of mTOR actually, which then stimulates the growth of the cell, okay? So why, why does it have to be so complicated? Why do we have two GTPases that control some kind of signal and then red controls another signal? And that's because mTOR is not just a simple protein or a kinase, it's really critical to recognize there's nutrients present and there's growth factors present, right? And if both of them are there, then we can signal the cell to grow. Because otherwise, you know, if you don't have growth factors, um, you probably shouldn't be growing, right? And if you are growing, then likely you're, you're, you're cancer, right? Or, or when there's no nutrients, you shouldn't be growing either because you'll drive yourself to death, right? Or you, you, you basically split and, and have nothing to, to grow on, okay? So, so, so enter is really that critical uh, master regulator, as we call it, of, of growth and proliferation, because it can detect those signals and make a decision whether to grow or recycle uh, available material and just wait for better times to, 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 to come. All right, and, um, and you've heard of logic gates before, I'm sure. And, and, the, and we call mTOR a, a logic gate that's this particular AND gate. And, and the reason uh, for this is because AND gate is actually that one of those gates where both inputs need to be present and high at one versus zero, so one, in order to give an output. And this is exactly uh, how, how, I how I like to show mTOR uh, complex one as a, as a native molecular AND gate um, for growth. So you can, we can draw this as a, as a circuit. So one, nutrients are a switch and growth factors are another switch. So nutrients signal to RAGs and growth factors signal to REP. And enter will be that gate in the middle here. So when both are off, um, your light bulb doesn't come on, right? And then when growth factors are on, it still is not enough to switch the, the light bulb, which would be the growth on. Uh, neither does nutrients alone. You have to have both of those inputs um, present in order for, for the growth machinery to start. Okay, so this is how we, we like to think about mTOR and how it controls the growth, right? So so you saw in that, in, that, in that video that I showed you that it took roughly 12 minutes, um, 12 to 15 minutes for this stimulation to really kick in. And that's, and, and if you think about this, right, you, you re-stimulated the cell with the, with the nutrients. So they had to first uptake all those nutrients in, then realize, oh, wow, we got nutrients and then let's switch the growth. Um, so that actually takes quite a lot of time. And, and, and GTPases by themselves, those proteins are not that fast. They're actually pretty slow. So they will not switch uh, just by themselves very quickly. They require other proteins that would stimulate the hydrolysis or that switching. And, and there's a bunch of them that our lab discovered. One of them is called Gator1. The other one is called Folliculin, FNIP2. There's this membrane protein called SLC389. And we, we study those proteins in the lab. And they, their role is basically to sense or relay a, a, a signal from the cell, from other sensors in the cell that detect amino acids into the RAG GDPases. And this is particularly the part of that pathway that our lab is very interested in because RAGs are important for this nutrient sensing. 
And, and this is something that I really wanted to focus on today, where how, how those rags work and how they can make sure that at the right time, they're available for docking of, of mTOR, all right? And now, when you, when you look at those rags, actually, um, they're pretty interesting because they can either bind to this triphosphate, which I'm showing as a T letter, it's a green, green background, or a diphosphate, right? So technically, you've got two possible uh, combinations that each, each rag can take. So it's a very a binary switch. However, because you have two of them, all of a sudden, you, you get four possible combination, right? You can get those DT states or TD states, which we call inactive or active states. And, and, and that basically the activity is reflected by whether mTOR can bind to it or not. So mTOR can bind only to this state. And this is something our lab discovered for a series of metagenesis. Um, and, and there's an inactive state that, that basically rejects mTOR. And it turns out actually there's transient states that a postdoc in our lab, Huang, has been, has been studying a lot. And, and he, he found that those states uh, which have the same, uh, the same nucleotide bound, uh, they're very transient and they push the equilibrium such that everything kind of lands in those, in those either active or inactive states. And so that's quite a, that's, that's quite of an interesting uh, thing to, to think about as well, because technically if these are transient, they don't really exist that much, then why do we have such a complicated switch system where everything boils down to only two conformation, right? So there is something more to it that we still don't understand, but we're still, uh, we're still trying to, 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 to get, really that information and maybe figure out maybe those transient states are really important with switching and how, how this whole system uh, changes over time. Okay. So I'm a structural biologist and when you, when you structural biologist, you try to, before you do anything with, uh, with proteins, you try to figure out how, how heavy they are, how big they are, because um, if they're too heavy or too big, it's, it's really hard to, to coax them into crystals. You can really crystallize them. And this is crystallization is one of the main techniques how we, how we used to look at proteins. And, and recently with this development of, of high resolution cryo-electron microscopy, uh, that barrier has been broken where we can actually look at proteins without the need of crystals. And, and, and actually the bigger the protein, the better. However, at the same time, if your protein is really big, it will have some intrinsic movements to it. Right, so there is there is that problem too, where if it's just so big, proteins are not just rigid rocks; they're actually machines, and they do stuff. So, so that's also a limit. And this is this is something I'll tell you in a second why we made some decisions that, that um, to to actually make this uh, make this project work. Okay, so if you look at mTOR, and mTOR has all those accessory proteins that our lab discovered in the past. And, and I started counting the mass of each of them. And, and it's been shown that mTOR actually is a dimer. It doesn't exist just a single, single protein, but it has a dimer plus each of those protomers that we call in a dimer, they have those extra anchors and extra proteins bound to it. So if you, if you start basically checking how many, how many atoms are there, and there's something around 1.3 megadaltons. And, um, and that's huge if you think about it because a bacterial ribosome is only just about twice as big. So it's, it's a huge protein. And, um, and we expect that it's going to be around 20 to 30 nanometers in size, which you, know, you might think it's small, but for us uh, protein scientists, actually this is pretty big. And, um, and these are all those um, masses that I started calculating. And, but at the same time, you know, we, we thought, okay, why do we need to study something that's so big um, maybe it will be flexible because clearly there's those two arms that might be floppy. It might be really hard to see the, the details of that. So we thought, okay, let's focus on something that is small enough, but it will give us all the information that we need, sorry, big enough, that will give us all the information that we need. And, and that part of this protein is basically the critical subunit of mTOR complex one that we call Raptor. And Raptor is that protein that recognizes the rags and brings mTOR into the, into the lysosome, okay? And of course, the rags and regulator, which are the which is the anchor, okay. And and in order to to study proteins, we first need to make them. Right? We need to make them in either bacteria or in in or in human cells, in some kind of organism or or a cell line that will produce them in high amounts. We can then extract them and and then image them, okay. And and there's this technique that many of you may be familiar with. It's called chromatography. And particular type of chromatography here is that we eat, that, that I have this drawing of its size exclusion, which means it separates proteins by size. So if you if you pour a 
solution of, of proteins that are different sizes, they will go through that matrix and that has those pores. And those pores act as little retardant. So if, if your protein is small, it will get captured in that pore and it will slow its progression. So, you know, they flow with gravity or with some kind of pump pressure from the top. And you see the small proteins get captured over time and the big proteins fall through because they're so big, they, they don't really get captured inside. And, and that way you can really separate those proteins by size. And, um, and this, is, this is a readout of uh, how, we, how we purified uh, by chromatography, uh, Raptor, Rax, and Regulator Complex. And you'll see that there's this first peak right there and it has this long tail and there's another peak and at the end is a nucleotide. So basically I spiked this, this complex with a bunch of nucleotides um, so that they can be in the right state um, for Raptor to, to, to bind to RAX, okay? And here, this is a, this is a gel uh, that many of you may have seen uh, what gels look like. It's basically a, uh, also some kind of migration uh, of proteins uh, and, um, and it, it's, it acts similar to, to gel filtration, but instead of retaining the entire complex together, it actually destroys proteins in the process. So instead of seeing the entire complex traveling together like this, you see those individual bands, and they're basically ripped apart. And, and this and here on the left, you see this, uh, this ladder. So it tells you, you know, what the sizes of those proteins are that you're looking at. And you'll see that in this peak one, we have all the proteins present. So there's a bunch of them, right? There's, there's Raptor, there's RAX, A and C, and there's the entire regulator complex made with five proteins. And then when you look to the right, um, into this tail or peak two, there's less and less Raptor and, uh, and the same amount of RAX or the same amount of regulator, which means this complex is not very stable. And, and actually the, the experiment that I'm showing you is, is this chromatography experiment is one of the best ones I've ever made before. Um, and it's the most stable. Uh, before we could hardly ever get Raptor to bind to Rax, and that was that was quite a challenge actually for us to to make it. Because if you think about it, if if Raptor was binding to Rax so easily, then it would have probably bound uh, when nutrients were not present just by random. So we had to actually mutate Rax so that it would they would mimic the state when nutrients are present. So we, we took it took us some time, more than a year actually, to figure this out. So it's a it's a very long project in that sense. Okay, so now with that we had. The complex in hands, we took that peak because we could fractionate this. Uh, we, we could take this first peak and, and start looking at this with PRIEM. And as you, as many of you know here, we have this amazing facility that, that Vladimir was telling about um, at the beginning um, that uses those small disks that have this grating of a very particular size. And on those disks that are made from any type of metal you can think of, um, gold, copper, um, nickel, for instance. And on top of that grid, uh, there's a layer of carbon. And oftentimes it's amorphous carbon. It's basically a support. Uh, but in the type of microscopy that we've been using, it's this special, special type of carbon that is perforated with a very precise holes and very precise distances between those holes. And this is quite advanced technology, how, how, how those people make it. We use it um, in order to put proteins into those holes such that there's no background when we look at, when we look at those, um, those proteins, um, okay? And, and this is what a microscopy, uh, a cryem hole looks like. You can see this is under, under very high magnification in the microscope. And, and this is basically an image of an empty hole. There's, this, is some, this is some junk, um, some, maybe some, some dust, some particles in there, but you don't really see protein in here, okay? And, and this is, for instance, um, uh, an ice, um, cubic ice block that's sitting in that hole. And this happens because what we really want uh, from cryem is that when we freeze our protein, is that ice doesn't form cubic, cubic um, lattice. It, it's amorphous so that we freeze it so fast that it's vitrified, so those, water atoms are not able to form an ordered lattice. And therefore we see this nice background like this where it's vitreous versus this cubic ice, which has this kind of patterning that is really like, if we had the protein in here, it would be interfering with that, okay? 
Um, so that's the goal. And that's, um, so this is when I was actually doing those experiments. It was actually before our facility was even built. It was in 2016. And I was traveling to Brandeis University to actually do those, uh, do this imaging, okay? And eventually I improved, um, improved my preparation such that you could start seeing those little dots. And I hope you can see them. These are those very tiny dots that are here at the, at the periphery of the, of, the, of the hole. And after multiple rounds of improvements and trying to increase the protein concentrations and condition, I ended up with this. And you can see there's a ton of dots. In the in the middle and this is our protein this is our complex so you can see that if you think that this hole is roughly uh, 1.2 microns in size those dots are approximately 20 to 30 uh, even smaller actually maybe like 10 nanometers okay so these are pretty tiny right and uh, so having that really nice looking grid with um, holes that were full of proteins I was able to collect the data and at the only facility at this time that was actually open to for, for users in the area and that was at UMass and I collected a, a ton of data um, of those those um, those proteins that you can see here and and at the time when I was looking at this I had no idea what these things were now I know exactly what I'm looking for so I can I can show you with exactly which which things are, are, are complex and this is basically what it looks like. So I, I inverted the contrast here and you can see those little, this is how I was picking those particles. I was able to identify them and then say, extract this little part of the micrograph and, and try to average them out, try to see if, if some of, there's some kind of pattern to them, if they, if they are the same or they're different and can you classify them for me? Okay, and, and of course, you know, I had thousands of micrographs. I wouldn't have been able to do this by, by eye. And there were very two important advancements at that point when I was starting here at MIT, um, particle picking algorithms. So they were driven by deep learning uh, methodology and, and particularly there was there were those two algorithms, one was called Topaz and that was discovered or discovered, actually developed by, um, by Tristan Bettler from, from Bonnie Berger's lab at, at MIT Computer Science and Cryolo, um, right? by Torsten Wagner from, from, from Germany. And they, both of these guys really did an amazing job in, in allowing me to pick particles that were actually here in this, in this vitreous ice that you see inside of a hole and uh, picking those. Um, because previously the, the particle picking algorithms, they were basically picking from, from those very electron dense areas, which is the carbon layer that I showed you about. So you can see that's the edge of that hole. That's, that's something that we want to look at. There's low background, versus the high background here, like as you would see here, like things get picked from there. So that was very an important um, methodological advancement for me that allow me to really do this, uh, to do this work. Okay, and then when you, when you take those proteins together and you start classifying them, you start seeing some kind of patterns, right? The, the background disappears because the, the signal that is coming only from protein gets amplified basically, or and, um, and, and you start seeing some kind of features. And when I, when I first saw this class, I was really excited because you can see this little round thing. And that round thing is basically what I thought at that point was a WD-40 propeller. It's basically a protein structure that looks like a ring. And I knew that Raptor has that kind of ring because there were people before me who actually got the crystal structure of Raptor before. So we knew what Raptor looked like. And I thought this could be something um, that actually makes sense. And, and then maybe this is the rest of the Raptor and these are rags and this is regulator. And it actually turned out to be true. And when I started classifying further, I could get sharper images and more of those classes, different views from different, different, um, different parts of the protein were, were visualized. And then when I took all of this and, uh, and, I, and I started looking at, okay, if, if these projections are from those, those ends, can I reconstruct the sphere? Can I reconstruct the sphere of those projections? And therefore um, the, the 3D model of that protein and initial classification gave me something like this. So they all look um, very similar to some extent. You can see that head and then there's this little round thing here on the side. And some of them look nicer or sharper, I would say, and some of them look a little bit like fuzzy. And you can see by the, by the distribution of how many particles are inside that, you know, the class one, which had really 80% of particles really looks like the best. And, and this is the part that I, I took and I started working with them. And, and those are the classes that you see on the right hand side. They're likely, you know, affected by some kind of 
um, maybe they're overlapping with other particles, maybe they're damaged, um, so they don't look so good. Okay, and then when you when you take a class like this, and and at this point it was a very low resolution, which means 47 angstrom, which means you can really tell apart only two points in space, which are 47 angstrom apart. And when you start refining this, so try to align it better also, you know, I went through a lot of effort to collect extra data and further classify it and refine it. I was able to arrive at a resolution around three angstrom and with, with around 110,000 particles. And, and at that resolution, um, you can actually start seeing side chains and, and the entire backbone of your protein. So you can really see the details, the chemistry of the protein, the intricate details of how those proteins interact. Okay, so let me show you the structure. So I have a little video which I wanted to play to you. And I hope this doesn't lag too much. Um, the internet connection is not perfect, but it, it goes smoothly on mine, but it's probably, it's probably jumping on yours. Anyway, uh, you'll see that I colored this by protein. So, so the blue one here on the left is, um, that's RAC A and the gold one is RAC C. And you can see those two are bound to the, to the salmon colored light red um, raptor. And here at the bottom, there's this very colorful part uh, and that's regulated by the five proteins, okay? And what you see here on the left, that's the electron density. So basically parts that we discovered um, in our electron micrographs, they are full of electrons, which means they contain the structure. And on the right hand side that you see here, that's an atomic model that we were, were able to build into that map. So that represents with a bit more detail what and the positions of those atoms in this protein. Okay, so now that we have this structure, we can see how, this, how those proteins interact. Um, and and, and, and if, you, if we look back at those things where, you know, we're drawing those images of, of mTOR uh, landing on a lysosome, like a little bit of a cartoon, can we now build an image like this, but with a very detailed atomic structure, okay? And, and this is something that we have right now, right? So you can start seeing, so you can start seeing the rags actually as opposed to something that we saw before. Here we were drawing, you can see mTOR kind of docking, like, like a little spaceship docking on the surface of a lysosome supported by those pillars of rags. Now what we can see is actually those pillars are not really pillars, they're more like clamps. They're very flexible on those tails, you can see here, and they bind the raptor from the top and they bring this down to the surface, okay? Such that they can interact with red, which would be, which would be sitting here somewhere in the, in the lysosome and then stick to the, stick to the, um, stick to the enterokinase domain, okay? And, and we really now physically can explain how enter complex one acts as an AND gate can see that nutrient availability is conferred by binding to those racks, which is the localization on the lysosome. And the growth factor ability is, is given by this protein red in here that binds. And, um, and I have this video I really wanted to show you that really shows how, um, how I think about this, how we think about um, enter docking on the lysosome. Okay, so you've got this complex of racks and regulator. Um, I'm drawing regulator as fully green so that it doesn't confuse people too much with too many colors. And the regulator is attached to the lysosome with a flexible linker. And mTOR is somewhere there in the cytosol. And then when nutrients are available um, in the cell, the switch on the racks happens and, 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 and first raptor uh, subunit of enter complex one docks on it. And that's probably flexible. It's, it's, it's flopping around until it finds another rag regulator attached to the lysosome and it docks the second raptor. And that way it's, it's more stable on the lysosome and it's searching for a red to get activated. And if, when it finds one, it docks and becomes activated, okay? So this was a little bit of a simplistic version of how red actually docks on, the, on mTOR. And, uh, and there's a work from Pavletic lab from, from New York City, from Sloan Kettering. They actually mapped how, how red is able to bind mTOR. And I wanted to show you that video. Um, right here. So this is something you've seen. It's mTOR with, um, with MLSD8 and Raptor bound to it. And, and when a red binds, just like you saw in the, in the previous video, it actually induces a conformational change in that kinase. It gets squeezed inside and through those conformational changes, it activates the kinase and it can then go and activate 
downstream signals that would uh, initiate the growth, okay? And this can only happen when, when actually mTOR complex one is on the surface of the lysosome because the binding of REP to mTOR is really weak, okay? So you can see that conformational change. It's really like this, this squeezing of those two halves of mTOR that, that happened here at this point, okay? And that induces this active site to be a little bit tighter and, and, and brings the substrate uh, with the ligands uh, to be phosphorylated, all right? Okay, so uh, I digress into the REP uh, part on a tangent, but something that I really was interested in this, in this project is those rags. So let's go back to them and, and let's start thinking, okay, so now we have this structure. Can we explain actually mechanistically or you know, with chemical interactions between proteins, how is it possible that Raptor can recognize that nucleotide state on rags that would reflect the, the, the nutrient state of the cell, right? Whether there's, there's actually food there or not, right? How can Raptor recognize this on rags? And, and before I can tell you that, I need to take you through quickly through a topology of rags uh, with their build up. So rags um, are made of this, um, they have this domain here that's called the roadblock domain, and this is how they dimerize, okay? And you can see rag A in, in purple is coming together with rag C. And on top, there's those two flexible domains. Uh, and these are those GDPAs, so those G proteins, which can actually bind to nucleotides. And there's this GDP and this GDP. And those domains are only connected to the bottom domain with this flexible linker here. So they kind of are, oh, you could imagine them, they're moving like this. They're not really rigid. And, um, okay, and, and there's some kind of space between them. And there's, those domains are really the key thing that bind those nucleotides and, and reflect the state. Uh, of the nutrients in the cell. All right, so let me let me let me tell you also about what happens with uh, with rags uh, when they bind to a nucleotide or when they bind, you know, one nucleotide versus the other. So GTP versus GDP. Okay, and this is something that you've seen before. This is rags with regulator, uh, a video, and we're going to zoom in on rag C, and particularly on that GTPase domain. And I'll be drawing this structure in this cartoon version. This is something that we like to draw. And uh, you will see that RAX has those three particular regions uh, that are very common between uh, GTPases. And it's, they're called switch one, switch two, and interswitch. So basically a switch machinery of a, of a GTPase. And, and you can see that a nucleotide uh, is coupled um, to actually, it's, it's bound to a magnesium ion as well. It's, it's coordinated here by one of the threonines on the switch one and, and two oxygens on that phosphate that we call beta and gamma uh, on, on, a, on, on GTP, okay? And, and what I did here, I basically tried to, so this is a structure, this is not my structure, this is a structure from actually Structural Genomics Consortium and that they solved the crystal structure, very well detailed structure of, of RAC C, the GTPase domain bound to GTP and magnesium, okay? And I did a little bit of a simulation on that um, where you can actually see in time what's changing, you know, it's called molecular dynamics. And you can see that, you know, this switch one is kind of flopping around, but it's not doing that much, right? Let's rewind this um, a little bit. this again. So you see that really not, not much has changed in there, okay? It's still, everything is still in place, okay? And now I'll be showing you how, how the GDPase is actually hydrolyzing it. So we don't really exactly know whether this happens before and after the switch movement, but you can see in the middle, there is this one strand, the one that's shown in black, that's moving up and down. It's sliding up and down. And and during that process, this hydrolysis happens. So you'll see that GDP all of a sudden loses that third phosphate in here, it goes away, okay? And in that state, when that third phosphate is gone, I run, and this is our structure at this point, right? So this is what we actually see in our cryo structure when RAC C is bound to diphosphate. I was able to run this, uh, this simulation and all of a sudden now you can see that this, this red switch one, it just goes away, it just shoots off. And that's because we don't have, now we lost this third, uh, third phosphate in here and those molecular interactions that were preventing um, this switch from going away now are gone and it just flies off and it, it's very flexible, okay? So it kind of opens up and those switches really protect those nucleotides uh, from any outside um, inter in interference, okay? 
and you can see it's just, if we keep playing this for for micro for, for microseconds uh, it just goes on All right and um, so now how can you couple this to, to Raptor and can we connect this information now that we learned how the switches work and uh, when they're bound to triphosphate or diphosphate we know the switches are moving left and right up and down and they're flexible or not can we now couple this to how Raptor works and can we infer some information from the structure that we have with Raptor bound? So Raptor, as you know, it has this WD-40 propeller domain at the bottom here. It has this uh, and terminal extension that binds to mTOR uh, with RNC and the middle part here that's called um, the alpha solenoid is actually the, the, the most critical part. And this is probably jamming like crazy on your, on your videos, but basically what I'm trying to show here in this video is that uh, mTOR, uh, Raptor is trying to bind to RAG A, but it's very ineffective. It's, it's kind of binding, but then it's coming off. It's, it's very weak. And, and now, you, now that you start thinking about this um, and, and try to rationalize why it's not working, it's, it's because it's trying to detect the switch of RAG A. Um, and I'm drawing those switches here for you in, in, either, on, um, in either purple or, or, or gold for RAG A and RAG C. And you see that those switches are rotationally symmetrical to one another, right? There's a switch, there's a switch one, and there's a switch machinery of RAG-A on this side, and then switch machinery of RAG-C on the other side. They're not mirror images, right? They're rotationally symmetrical, if you take this thing over there, right? So if if we know the Raptor, and from our structure, we know the Raptor binds from the from the top, and it sticks to RAG-A, how is it possible they can possibly detect uh, the switch of RAG-C, and how can, it, how can it figure this out, okay? And, and I've been thinking a lot about this, and and um, and um, and I wanted to show you what we believe is is the reason for that. Okay, and if you if you start looking at the hydrolysis of um, of GTP on Rag C, you'll see that little switch that happened before that I showed you. So we lose the phosphate now, and when you lose that phosphate, uh, the switch machinery of of of, um, of Rag C will start opening. Like as you saw in that simulation, it was really floppy, okay? So this will now open and providing that extra space in between of the two racks, okay? And that extra space now can be utilized by something, right? For instance, Raptor. So let's take a look at what Raptor will do if, if it had that extra space, okay? And it turns out Raptor has this extra region that only precipitated or only, only rigidified when we had our structure. And we call that region the Raptor Claw. It's basically 20 amino acids that go in and lock inside that space that has been created by hydrolyzed RAC um, GTP bound to on bound to RAC C. Okay, and this is this is this is basically how Raptor can recognize that state on the other side from RAC A, and therefore be able to detect what the nutrients are present or not, and recognize both states. So that that was the basically the the question that we had at the beginning and now by looking at the protein we're able to explain exactly how it works okay um, let me play this for you again so you can actually see that docking right. okay so so now we've figured out how how this works but can we now go back all the way to the original um, video that we had where proteins were landing on the lysosome. Um, and um, just to confirm that what we're thinking is right, that the claw, the raptor claw is correct. And uh, we made those mutants in cells. Uh, and, and this was actually done by, by two talented PhD students in the lab, Shingu and Jibril Kadir, where they were able to, and many of you might not be familiar with those kind of plots, but basically what we're looking at, we, we transfected cells with a flag tag raptor, a wild type raptor, and were able to pull it from the cell and see whatever was bound to it. And you can see that we were able to pull RAG A and RAG C with it. And, um, and of course, raptor is present and that meta bound that you can see here, that's just a control, something they should not bind. And indeed it doesn't bind. So that means that our system, uh, our experiment is actually fine-tuned and it works, okay? And then when we made Raptor, uh, we transfected the cells with Raptor that carried all those claw mutations. There's a bunch of them that we designed based on the structure. Uh, even though Raptor was made, and you can see it's, it's right here, um, it was unable to bring rags down. So which means that the claw 
really is critical to lock this interaction in place and strengthen it and so that actually Andor can, can do analyzes on, okay? And let's take a look at the fluorescent images uh, that, we, that, we, that we took, okay? So before I was showing you that those, those, um, those human cells, what they look like, and uh, they have those massive nuclei you can see, and outside of that, that's the cytosol. And, and we have two proteins that we visualize. One is mTOR, and the other one is LAMP2. And LAMP2 is a very special protein that sits precisely on the lysosomal surface. And you can see uh, those little dots. And, and so in the case of LAMP2, it will always be localized to that, and you will always see those dots. And, and we visualize this with a, with a red color here, and you'll see that um, mTOR is, is colored by, with green in this kind of merges here on the right, those zooms. And, and those cells here on top, these are wild type cells that were starved for amino acids uh, for 50 minutes. And then we re-stimulated them with an extra injection of amino acids for 10 minutes. And you'll start seeing that mTOR now shows the same localization pattern as LAMP2 LAMP does, which means it localized on the, on the lysosomes exactly what we expected, right? And now those mergers here on the right, you can see that red and green become yellow, right? Because they're really on top of one another. And this is how you can distinguish how something is really sitting on top, right? And now that we know the structure, we're able to mutate the interface between RAG A and, and Raptor so that we can disrupt it and really confirm that this is the key interaction that is responsible for Raptor and mTOR to bind uh, to the lysosomal surface. And, and here's that mutant that we made, okay? So here, here that you can see that wild type protein has those planktae when it's re-stimulated with amino acids. And here at the bottom, you don't see those planktae. It's still pretty much very well diffused in a cytosol. And the merge just shows you both orange and green dots. There's no yellow really, not so much, okay? So that was really beautiful for us. And, and we, were, we were really happy that, that we were able to discover how Raptor um, can recognize the nucleotide state and that this all goes back to the original video that we showed uh, that was, was recorded in David's lab. Um, and, 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 and so this research really provided a new way of thinking how those dimeric GTPases work, right? Because they, each, each GTPase protein is, is a binary switch, but then we have two of them. So there's four different states and this opens a lot of space for further investigation that we're trying to, that we're trying to follow up right now. And something that's very critical and, and, and useful about cryem structures of any type of protein structures is that it provides a foundation for, for development of, of molecules that would go into those crevices in between the proteins and basically disrupt those interactions. So they can design or improve a molecule that would go in there and disrupt them specifically. And, uh, and especially in, in something as critical for growth as mTOR, that would be very useful if we could improve or design completely novel drugs that would disrupt and help patients that uh, suffer from diseases that are, that, that are deregulated in, um, in, in growth. For instance, cancer is one of those examples, okay? Um, this is it. Uh, I wanted to really thank uh, David Sabatini, who, who, who mentored me over those years and, and dedicated the huge amount of resources to this project and, and believed in me that this can, this can really happen and, and, and we, did, we did manage in the end. And massive thank you go to, to Edie, Mandy and Duyen who, who basically run the lab. Um, they, yeah, our lab would fall apart without those guys. There are these, there are lab, our lab managers, our lab techs, and they, they support us immensely. Okay, and, and the other group, uh, that that's actually the, the most important group of people to me are, are my students. And you can see there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good number of them, and they've been um, incredible in driving the work that I've just showed you. So many of them directly contributed to, to this project, and if not directly to that, to, to other projects that we carry in the lab. So massive thank you to these guys, Sandra, Alana, Matteo, Itzke, Luke, Angie, Dan, Rika, Laura, Alexia, Anna, and Sherry. On top of this, there's a team paper, uh, and, and, and these are the people who I really helped me 
I really needed the most and who helped me the most when we were about to publish this paper. So they really jumped in and helped me helped me drive it to the uh, to the finish line. Okay, Shinja Brill, Montre, and Neuf, and uh, the entire Sabatini lab who is a uh, who are the incredible crowd. And and I, I I don't I cannot imagine myself being anywhere else and and doing this research. Um, the people who were in the lab and who, who supported me and, and provided incredible amount of ideas for this for this and other projects. People in the in the Whitehead Institute, especially a lab of um, Jinka Wang of, of Ian Chiefman, um, Nikki Watson, who was uh, who was our facility manager uh, for uh, for TEM or not cryem but electron microscopy facility at Whitehead, which was really important for me to get started and, and get some images going. And particularly high performance computing team from, from Whitehead who um, who allow me to actually bring in software and that that big thanks also go to HHMI who, who sponsored that um, hardware that you know it's it's something that I didn't show you here but we have this incredible cluster at Whitehead uh, that allows us actually to to calculate all those um, all those structures that you've seen and it requires a huge huge computational power to, power to make that happen and these people actually maintain and install all that software that i've been using so big thanks to craig peter paul and rob and and many other people at the broad at mit biology and particularly to 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 mit nano uh cryem team led by ed uh, and pat and sue and anthony who we've been starting together to work on those on those and learning how to do cryem at mit nano those particular microscopes that we have and there's this it's just a huge explosion since those days of projects that we are carrying right now okay many thanks to to mike rigney at brandeis who of course the original person we did images images with at brandeis and, and people at umass uh, particularly kang kang and people at dana farber who help us do some um some assays and of course the funding from last garden and tubers Sclerosis association big thank you uh casper thank you so very much uh for giving a fantastic talk we went a little bit long uh and so we're going to have to limit our questions just for a couple of questions if you uh want to react uh down on the bottom there is a reaction button and you are more than welcome to uh do as i will um provide a clap or thumbs up uh if you have a question uh do feel free writing it in the chat or the other option is to go to participants, and that's a button on the bottom. Uh, click on it and raise your hand. It will show that you raise your hand and I'll call on you to ask the question. We only have a time for a couple of questions. So uh, any questions we can direct to Casper. Casper, uh, let me ask you a question very quickly. Um, the uh, cryo-EM has indeed provided a revolution in thinking about how to visualize uh, proteins. Before that, as I understand it, only proteins that could be crystallized would we be able to truly understand some rough structure of how they look. Um, the, uh, clearly, the electron microscopy can be very, very damaging uh, to organic matter when it's being imaged. So what's the key in the cryo-EM providing this revolution? Is it the fact that you can take low flux, electron flux images of cells, kind of fuzzy, but you take 10,000 images and average them. Is that the way it goes? Yeah, I think, I think you nailed it exactly. It's, it's the fact that we can keep it cold, uh, which means it's, it's frozen solid in state. So it actually doesn't move so much. And, uh, and that, yeah, we have a low flux. So we really just, just, just image, like basically irradiate them just enough to see them, but not to damage them. So that's the so-called low dose approach to, to, to imaging those proteins. And, and the second point, point that you mentioned is this average, right? So we cannot really see individual particle. Uh, we can see it just about, like as I showed you in those images, but it really takes those 100,000 particles that you can, that they were perfectly imaged and then, then average them out and really get that signal um, to really show you what the, what the, protein, what the protein looks like. Um, I have a quick question from uh, Doug Fishkind uh, from the chat here. It says, uh, how do GDP and GTP, uh, non-hydrolyzable um, analogs, affect the stability of the mTOR complex? Right, so actually the, the work that we did here um, was done with uh, native nucleotides. So we didn't, uh, we didn't use the non-hydrolyzable um, nucleotides, but um, but we have some other projects when we when we use the non hydrolyzable ones and uh, and they actually work just as well and uh, they they really mimic 
very well the native nucleotides and they um, and they they promote the stability uh, it, yeah they do promote it okay um, from Anthony Schuller uh, question um, what is the current model for nutrient sensing? Uh, is there some interactions between the complex and cestine, uh, cestrine, for example? Uh, something you're following up on? Yeah, so there's a lot of those um, directions that we're trying to follow up on. So, so all those inputs that I was showing you from, 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 from before, like how, how is that sensing? How does it work? How does it physically come to enter? And, and all of those nutrients uh, are really being passed as you know as a, as a signal all the way to racks and and there's proteins that modify that and uh, that state on racks and there's called gaps and gaps and one of them is gator 2 for instance that we really don't know how it works and this is the protein that mediates the cestrin um, detection or sensing of leucine and this is something we're really working on right now we're trying to crack it and um, it's it's a tough problem but we're working on it all right, the last, the very last question, again from uh, uh, Doug Fishkind. Uh, do you know how the CLO domain affects the rates of GTP hydrolysis? Um, very interesting studies, awesome data and modeling. You know, this is actually pretty, pretty a good, good insight. We, we never tested this, you know, this is something that I think uh, is worth trying. I think, yeah, that's a, it's, it's a good point. We never tried uh, to check how, how Raptor affects this. I think it's, it's, it's a good point. Thanks. Surely. Uh, well, I, again, Casper, uh, it's a true pleasure to have you today. I, it's really wonderful to see the, emergent, the emerging of the biology, nanoscale science, and a massive data processing that's needed uh, to uh, almost like a magician recreate from the fuzziness of the images uh, perfection uh, that indeed inspires us to understand biology in a much, much deeper way. Uh, so thank you all very much for attending uh, this seminar. Uh, the next seminar is uh, going to happen next coming Tuesday. It is uh, focused on sensing presence in virtual reality. Um, and the following seminar on Thursday is on seeing super lattices, imaging hidden Moira pe periods at a nano island 2D material interface using 4D scanning transmission electron microscopy. I look forward uh, to tuning in uh, next week. Uh, again, thank you very much for attending today. We'll see you soon. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Vladimir.